Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. There's still a few seats in the front. It's like in the, it's like at, you know, it's like at INSEAD in the class. I was say, come, you know, you have, uh? we have to ask people to come. They want to stay in the back. Anyway. Hi, thanks for coming. My name is Katel Le Goulven. Uh, so I work at INSEAD. Uh, and uh, there I, uh, I head the Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society. And what we're trying to do in this, uh, what we're doing actually with this institute is to integrate sustainability into business education in the research, in the teaching, in the external engagement, so this kind of things, and in the operations of the school, with a strong um, belief that if we change business education, then we can also change business for good. Uh, I am also uh, in the board of Intent, an initiative that has been created by André and Rosalie Hoffman. Yes, well, that is there, okay. And uh, Intent is an initiative that basically promotes sustainable solutions by bridging, building bridges between ideas and people, bringing them together from different backgrounds and perspectives to advance the agenda. And so this SDG Tent is all about that, and you coming is part of that, okay. This event is also organized in partnership with the INSEAD Wendel, Wendel, Wendel? Vendel, Vendel International Center on Family Enterprise, right? So that's an expertise you'll typically find also in a business school focusing on that particular, particular topic. Morton is its academic director. So he's bringing that perspective to the conversation. Thank you, Morton. And uh, André is uh, joining us as the, also the head of Intent, the creator of Intent, but also the vice chairman of Roche. And then I'm delighted to also welcome Suni Hartford, who's from UBS, uh, she's president of UBS Asset Management, and it's raining, right? That's the rain, yeah. <laughs> um, and she's also the, the lead on sustainability and impact at UBS. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to be discussing the role of family business as a force for good. So why are we talking about this? Because family business uh, represents 80% of business globally. After Morton can say that it depends on the definition, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's never exact, but roughly it's the majority of uh, a family business. Uh, I think the estimate is also that they produce or they contribute to 70%, 70 of the global GDP. Same thing, it depends on the definition, but massive, right? And also uh, most entrepreneur and most new uh, 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 enterprise are created uh, by family members typically and funded by family money. Okay, so then the idea is if this family business are a force for good, we can really move the needle on an agenda we're trying to push. So force for good is very broad and fuzzy. Yes, so what do we mean by that? We mean uh, an intentionality of integrating societal progress in the business model of the firm. Okay, a firm can create jobs, contribute to poverty reduction, etc through trickle-down effect, we're not talking about this. All oh, this is great, but we're talking about the intentionality of a firm to contribu contribute positively, okay? So that's the agenda. What's the role of this family business in doing good, and how can we do more of it? So just so that we have a sense of who's in the room, and can you raise your hand if you work in a family business or are involved in family offices one way or another? Yeah, I leave that to Morton. <laughs> okay, but, oh yeah, see, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So then you get a sense. We just wanted to know, so, uh, so uh, I'm gonna start asking them questions and then it's all over to you, okay? So just, uh, that's the idea that it's a conversation. Thanks, so Morton again, you are the professor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> on family business. So tell us, um, I mean, you've been working on that for decades. So. Can you tell us what are the specific assets that family business have that makes them prone to having a net positive impact? With pleasure. It's, it's uh, fantastic to see so many in the tent here. So that, that's great. Um, family firms is not only the dominating business organization in the world uh, among private and mostly also among public firms. But we really strongly believe that family firms have a potential to be a driver for this intentional change. And I say potential, and I think we'll come back to that yeah. work later. Uh, and just to start from the helicopter view, uh, one way to look at it is that family firms have some special assets, which we often call family assets. They're, they're models, they're part of the business model in a family firm, 
that can be used and can be a driver of societal change. So just to make it completely simple, I mean, the first one is if you have at least a, a long living family firm, say second, third, fourth generation, you think in succession, you think about the next generation. And nowadays, it's very, very hard to think about, you know, your kid's future without thinking about the world, given the problems we have both in the short and in the long horizon. So the, the long thinking of many family firms uh, makes it natural to include other than just financial performance or financial measures, uh, the externalities, as we say, on the societies. I would say the second thing that we often observe in family firms that are in, in the front here is the loyalty. And loyalty sounds a little bit conservative, but I think it's a very powerful word. I mean, good family firms are loyal, and they are loyal to the family, they are loyal to the employees, they are loyal to the local communities. It's very hard to think about your employees without thinking about the local communities. They are sometimes loyal to countries, and you know the best and the biggest family firms are probably loyal to the entire world sometimes, or regions at least. Um, and, and this is a very strong feature of many family firms. And the third thing I would mention is that we often talk about family firms being value-based, and it's very clear again that when we look at some of the families that really make an impact, they have very strong values. And values are super good to integrate into the business model when we are talking about things which are harder to measure. Because, you know, when we talk about financial metrics, we, we know a lot about <laughs> we do this and, and that happens, right? When we talk about societal changes, things are new, uh, things are, solutions are not there. And that is where value-based leadership is shown to work very, very well. So this was my very short <laughs> introduction about this. And I would say three things, right? I would say the, the values, the longevity and the long, mind, long time mind in the head of the families and the loyalty are, are often three key drivers in this. So you say often first, so it's not, uh, <laughs> so it's not in all family business and uh, not all family business are doing good, right? Uh, so yeah. the intentionality <laughs> is important. So, right? Is that so I said correct? potential and I said often um, because we, of course, see all the time family businesses that make very bad impact on the society. We see family firms which are very short horizon. I mean, those of us who are old enough to, to remember the big corporate scandals in the US and and in the Europe were often driven by families who have very short horizons. Uh, we see families who have been involved in some of the biggest environmental catastrophes business have done, um, partly because they don't have the right values. <laughs> uh, we see families who have been involved in the opioid scandal in the US and, and many uh, uh, things that, that are not driven the society. So obviously I say potential because I think these assets are, are super important for driving changes, but it's not given just because we are a family firm that, that uh, these things will happen, not at all. Yeah, okay, thanks, and we can go back to that. So, Sunny, thanks for joining us. Uh, from your perspective, from a UBS perspective, you work a lot with family business. So where do you see that potential coming from? Uh, you took a strong stand on also pushing that agenda. So where is, uh, where is the drive coming from for you? So what we've discovered, and we've done some research, which is one of the, the joint reports that we did, we discovered that the the family businesses have a propensity to have shared values. They think holistically about their business front to back or end to end, as we say. They think about supply chain. Um, a lot of things that, you know, we talk about scope three emissions when we think about the world today. And a lot of institutional businesses really don't think that way. So, so there are a lot of differences in how the business is managed and run and owned, I guess is a part in the pun, uh, in that front to back scenario. We've also seen that family businesses are, um, they are more focused on data uh, and the impact that they're having. So forgive my notes, but I've got some stats here. 53% you know, of family businesses surveyed by EY and the University of St. Gallen, when they did their survey, um, are reporting formal ESG metrics. So I run the asset management business at, at uh, UBS. I can tell you that, that that is 10 times the number of institutional businesses that are reporting metrics. So there's a lot more data um, there's a lot more impact that these companies can have uh, when they make an effort. So just in terms of the scale, um, you talked about how large they are in the 80% of the businesses. So I've got another one, 500 family businesses, 24 million uh, employees, 7.3 trillion in revenues, 
113 family-owned businesses represent 80% of engineering and construction industry. And we talk about, again, I'll go back to uh, climate change and GHG emissions. That 80% is a big number, and that's going to be next up after fossil fuels in terms of focusing those industries on change in terms of their emission platform. So yeah, yeah. really important. And uh, do you see an appetite, uh, more important appetite now with that trend? Uh, you say that more have metrics on ESG. Mm -hmm. Do you see also more interest and appetite to do more in that space than the... It, it's universal. Um, there, right, cool. there, some of the surveys that we have, you know, 70% of family businesses say they believe it's their duty to lead in a climate changing world type thing. So again, the, the mentality is very, very different than on the institutional. And I will say it's probably because they have that long-term view. Most companies, they'll tell you, focus as far as the CEO. The average CEO tenure is, what, five years. So it's hard for them to focus out 20, 30 years. But family businesses do that. And maybe for also uh, quarterly reports. Uh, that too, and uh, analysts and, and all the rest that goes with the public company versus, say, a family owned that's not quite public yet. So, okay. Thanks. André, so you're a long-time advocate of, uh, uh, of family business as a force for good. So can you tell us where you see all these main assets and how you have yourself maybe activated them uh, in, in your own enterprise? Well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for everybody to have come at this, uh, this afternoon. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and it's great to be able to, uh, to, to talk about these issues, which I think are very important. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the most of uh, what I see as benefits for, for, for family businesses have just been mentioned, in particular this intergenerational thinking. Uh, you know, how do you think today about what's going to happen tomorrow? I think that's a very important consideration. And family businesses have this long-term horizon, which allow which allows them to uh, to think forward. Uh, as, as Martin very rightly said, when it works, it's brilliant. When it doesn't work, it's absolutely diabolical. And we all have examples in our, in our, in our circles of family companies which have gone completely wrong because the family does not get together. So one of the, the first requisites, I think, of family businesses is to make sure that the family is in order. Uh, you know, uh, INSEAD talks a lot about the parallel planning process where you should plan the family at the same time as you plan the company. But maybe, uh, maybe I'm going too, too fast when I talk about that. This is, yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. Just this is a negative a outcome. Get your family in order, meaning. <laughs> well, <laughs> right. make sure that, um, uh, you, well, the, the purpose of our conversation today is, you know, the, uh, business for good. Mm. And if you want the business to be a, a, a positive force on society, it needs to subscribe to certain values. And it needs us to make sure that the outcome of what you do in the business process is something that's positive for society. So yes, you can report on the ESG metrics, but you can also live them. You can also live yeah. these environmental, social, and governance values. And I think it's very dangerous for for, uh, for family to assume that because they are family owned, it's all going to be all there right. There you go. Right. Right. So, so, so this is not a prerequisite. That's the first step to take. I think the first step is to actually identify within the, the owners, and that, 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 that's what I mean by the fam get your family in order. Okay. In the owners, you need, you need to actually define what it is you're aspiring to go to. Yeah. You know, the, the, the company, uh, owning a company is a privilege, but it's also an incredible responsibility. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that you use this, this instrument in a way which is beneficial, not just to the shareholder, but to the society at large. So for those of you who come to Davos from time to time, uh, uh, Professor Schwab, since 50 years, has been talking about stakeholder economy. Mm -hmm. You know, shareholders are not the true owners of business. They are the legally the owners, of course. But they are also responsible for making sure that this company continues to serve the purpose of the business and um, uh, uh, serve the, the, the society in which they're active. So I think that's very important. You need to really define your purpose and to make sure that this purpose is well defended by the company. Right. Thanks, André. Uh, just a small pause. Please come to, yeah, there are seats here. Unless you want to stand, but there are seats here, so feel, you know, it's fine. If you stand all the time. It's a friendly be... space. <laughs> if, you, if you stand it's all the time. It's a family friendly space, may I, may I add. Okay, come on in. Okay, thanks. So, um, we don't uh, want you to be frustrated and aggressive on question time. Now, if you want to stand in the back because you have to go, it's fine. Um, so, Merton, let, let me get back to you. We recently, with UBS, and that's also why we're here. Oops, sorry, I'm, I'm losing all my <laughs> notes. Uh, we recently, with UBS, did uh, uh, a study on family businesses, right? We interviewed uh, key uh, family business leaders. And can you talk to us a little bit of the framework that came out of these interviews in terms of how to activate that intention, intention, intentional, I'm going to do it, intentional change for good. 
Sure, with pleasure. Uh, so, so we had the great pleasure to work with UBS on uh, the, the challenge was to not only write thick books about family firms, but actually write a map that families could use even if they didn't want to read 300 pages. So, so what are the action points if, if families want to get engaged? And we had the pleasure also to interview, I think, 15 of the very large uh, family business uh, entrepreneurs in the world, I think. Uh, yeah, global and, ones with global And there was one of them even. <laughs> um, and, and there come a lot of interesting knowledge about it. So, so you should really try to get it. But let me summarize it in, in a very short term. So basically, there are three steps if for families who wants to get involved in this starting from scratch and the first step is the very basic to comprehend what is what is the societal consequences of the business that you are running i think all families today start to ask these questions to to themselves if they're not very advanced in it um, the second level is the commitment um, which is you know to use this knowledge to commit to a purposeful business and uh, value driven the values that the family has that underlining this purpose and that process of course is is, is more advanced and i think you may be talking about that in a moment and and the third level is then the execution which we call compel so we got the three c's um so that is really to to execute this purposeful business strategy with some points to emphasize and i think what we emphasize is a, to have this kind of stakeholder inclusive view that it's not only a strategy for <laughs> the core of the business and, and for the owners, but it's, it's an inclusive view of the employees and the stakeholders around the firm. And second, that it's measurable, uh, that there are metrics around that can actually measure these uh, impacts that the firm is, is going. And, and then the bottom line is really to implement the vision, the purposeful vision into the business strategies. I think that was a very short introduction, but yeah. we can, so we can start So thanks for with. this. You've been studying family uh, enterprise for how long? 20? I, I don't, yeah, I'm going to have long. to reveal your age here <laughs> for a long time. Is this, I mean, um, what, what do you see is new here compared to what family business have done in the past? I, I think what we are actually getting at, because this is the, you know, knowledge from uh, 15 of the great families in the world, right? So, so I think we are hopefully mapping out the best policies right what, what the best people in this business are doing so in that sense it's not new but uh, as as we know there are many other approaches and many other families who are not that successful right so our aim here is really to to get the action oriented right so so uh, both generations or uh, all generations in the families can start to think about these things and start to create an action-based uh, conversation first of all in the family after after you know thinking about this map well, is it is it fair to say maybe that before family business were already thinking about these things but maybe they wouldn't put it on paper and publicly announce announcing to the world what were their real intentions is yeah that fair I, think, or no? I think that's true and and this is the process of of you know all these events and and all what is going on in many places and the agenda that Andrew and others are pushing it's not right? just events it's also <laughs> a climate crisis a biological yeah, yeah. So, crisis so, strong inequality i mean we have been thinking about this but but now there's a lot of tools and and hopefully this can be a powerful tool yeah. thank you so suni i understand that what resonated strongly with you personally was the commitment piece can you can you speak a little bit about that yeah i i and i think and maybe i'll start with your last question which i think one of the things that has changed um we have it in our purpose statements so the, the reimagining the power of investing i think businesses individuals feel more empowered than ever and they feel an ownership that they have to take action and so there's a a level of awareness um and that's really unique and i think you know, maybe the last five years, I can even say it, maybe yeah. the last decade, I think that's changed in how things went. So it comes in when you talk about, I've got two more C's for you, right? Which is uh, communicate, right? Which so you set your yeah. commitment and you know what you stand for, especially as businesses get larger, you need to over communicate what your purpose is. You need to drill it into everything you do. It's not just your brand or your logo, it's your signature page, it's every single part of what you do. So you over communicate to make sure it sinks in. Um, and then the other one is, as you say, embedding in it what you do, uh, your purpose, that's, that's another word for culture. 
right? And the only way, again, especially as you grow, that you can get your business to continue to represent your views and your values as a founder, as a member of the family, um, is to embed it in the culture. So that even when you're not looking or when it's someone else that's out there on their own, that they are still facing that tr proverbial true north uh, in the culture that you have. So I think that's, that's all part of it. And, in, and by the way, these are the two most difficult things for people yeah. to do, right. right? Communication, you can never communicate enough. Um, culture, you'll always have an outlier, how you react to that culture, maybe a bad actor or however you do it, someone that's at cross purposes with your culture uh, is going to be part of the challenge, uh, particularly for a family business, because generally if you're smaller, you know everybody, it's a little more sensitive there. So, Wait, And so you, do you feel also that there is increasing uh, ask for accountability uh, coming from, uh, I mean, there are internal forces, obviously. You know, so external so external forces, accountability right? is one way to say it. I, I think it's, it's as much ownership. Right. I think the idea that every individual in the world, every individual in the country, every individual in the company owns that purpose and executing on it so that you are ensured to be fulfilling the overall ambition of the company and the purpose that they set forward. So it's, it's that. I mean, I, that leads to accountability. I suppose everybody's accountable if they're an owner. So. Thanks. So, Andre, what's your what's your recipe for, you know, leveraging these assets that are not always put to good? Well, uh, first, uh, I'd like to come back to what right. just said here. I mean, yes, uh, a faceless company is not a good owner. Uh, what, what you want as an owner is to be able to personify what the action of the company is and how this company can actually live by the values you have to define. I'll give you the Roche example. We've given ourselves three values, courage, integrity, and passion. And this is a description of how we feel about ourselves. We want to be courageous by taking mm -hmm. the decision that others do not take. We obviously have to be integral since, we, since we, we're dealing with patients and we are passionate about what we do. And our purpose is doing today what the patient needs next. So long-term thinking in the process of innovation for, for unmet uh, medical need. So uh, having said that, if you really want to use the company that you happen to own, and often it is the second or the third generation who have to ask these questions, because the first question, the first generation uh, has, you know, they're still busy constructing the, 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 the vision, they're still busy constructing the idea. So it's really when you, when you inherit that you start having to think about this, how do I use this wonderful tool to make an impact that's positive on the, uh, on the planet? And one of the first things to do, of course, is to, um, as we said before, you have to define a roadmap. Where do you want to go and how do you want to use the, 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 um, the tool that, 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 I, that is in front of you? Why do you want to be nature positive? Why, don't you, why do you want to be uh, uh, society positive? Why do you want to be purposeful driven? Because you want this company to survive in the long term yeah. for transgenerational reasons. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> This is good, this is good. <laughs> the Sorry. question was like, what are the yeah. things you need to activate? Let me come back maybe to the yeah. values you mentioned, sure. Roche, for instance, right? Three values, so courage, integrity, passion. Mm. Do I have that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, these are super high order yeah. things, right? So I can see where they can be put in the mission statement, you know, on the wall, shared with all employees, but then how does that trickle down for change in a company? What, what's the what's the process here? Well, uh, I think the, um, if you talk about values, if you talk about uh, rules in general, uh, you're much better off to talk about. Uh, um, uh, I don't know what the vocabulary is here. Uh, I, I don't want to have metrics, and I need to do that. Right. I, want to, I want to be inspired. I mm. want to be pushed in a direction. And so if I talk about general values, as long as they're not too defined, every individual in the company can restitute them in yeah. a way that, 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 that satisfies them. As an employer, as, a, as, a, as somebody who provides employment to people who work with us, the last thing I want is people who come to me because they want the salary, the retirement benefits, the weekends, the holidays. The reason I That's want them to come good. to yeah. uh, <laughs> but not enough. Okay. Well, that's also good, of course. No, no, don't make me say things I haven't said. But, but, but the, 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 the reason you want them to come to you is because you want everybody collectively to construct something. Right. And if you say, I'm the owner, you do what I say, it's not going to right. work. Is that the role of the family to infuse these values, to speak about them clearly and to just you know, rally the employee around them? Is that the role of the board, the CEOs? I, I think the, 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 the owner can demonstrate a direction, right. a, a, a dimension, a, a universe, if you want. But uh, of course, the effective uh, implementation has to, do, has to do with management. Right. And the management, and that's one of the big differences in the study of family businesses, is that you know, some are family managed, 
ça. And then you have a, a, a big, uh, a, a big issue uh, about legitimacy, but that's perhaps another conversation. Uh, and, and then you have the ones that are owned. And I'm come back to what I said in my introductory right. remark. Uh, being an owner is not a passive state; it's an active state. Exactly. It's a job. You know, uh, you cannot just be uh, sitting at home and cutting the little pieces of paper which are going to allow you to, to cash in the dividend. You, you, you need to take that role of ownership seriously and to act convincingly in the company so that employees uh, or other, as we say today, colleagues can work together to, mm. go, to, go, to go one step further. Right. Again, I think, I hope it answers the question. Yeah, thanks. The role of ownership, Morten, I see you nodding. That's important, right? Do you see a key difference here? Obviously, obviously. <coughs> And I, and I think, I mean, now Andrea said it's so fantastic on the positive cases, right? I mean, ownership. Can you bring it closer to you? Ownership is really what what uh, drives the the beautiful of of the family businesses. But ownership is also what drives the when when it goes wrong, right. the the diabolic cases, as Andrew said. You know, I mean, I don't know if we need to mention names here, but but you know, we all know who you're talking <coughs> about. Uh, it's fine. What, what really happens is when the family is not responsible for the business, right? When the business generates money to the family, and the family may be extremely good at doing philanthropic and, and you know, doing good with the money they get, but the moment that, that there's a wedge between who leads, and it may even be the family mem some of the family members, but, but the management and the ownership, that's also where there's a huge risk of family firms not doing good. <laughs> So uh, we cannot emphasize that enough. I think it's it's about the responsibility of the business and the owners is a key there, right? It's not enough that that we are strong in in philanthropic uh, activities. So two points. I'm pinning two things. First, I want to say hi to people online. I mean, we just received a text from someone online, so I'm saying hi. I forgot to say welcome to this meeting. <laughs> so let me do that properly. Um, two things. One, uh, you spoke about you know generations. And two, you spoke about philanthropy. So I'm going to want to pin these two things, ask you a question about that before I open for questions in the room. So first, um, the role of um, transitions and generations. How is that changing that landscape now? Are the you know next gen now asking for more and pushing family business to enter that space more? What's your what's your take on that, Morton? As, yeah, as you're looking at me, it's for you. This and I'll ask everybody <laughs> the same question. No, no uh, this is a great question, and obviously this is, is one of the key questions we always talk about in family firm. But let's keep it for now for for transition in relationship to to doing good and putting this on the yes. agenda and the family. Uh, I think that the next gen, the young people, and I see many young people here uh, have a key role here, and I'm not just saying that to be nice, because first of all, my experience is, of course, when we talk about second, third generation, that the old generation often have been so focused on survival and whatever survival means and, and growing, and and they think that you know the agenda of society now n somebody thinks that the agenda of the society is a luxury problem, right? And that's where I think the young generation really push now because the young generation are much more concerned in many places about the society. And, and you are the, the old generation listen to the long generation, right? If, if we come from outside and say, you know, we think you should be more this and that, uh, they may not listen as much. But if the children come and say, you know, <laughs> we, want, we want to make an impact here, we, why are we not doing this? Uh, it may be that there's a big family fight, but in the end, they listen, right? And they listen for two reasons. First of all, they care <laughs> about the future of the family and care about, you know, that, that the next generation is taking over. But more cynically, they also listen because they some of the smart, what do we call them, senior generations, they also think this is a way to get the young generation in, right? Yeah. I mean, either the, the young generation goes and become activist <laughs> in, in some organizations as far away from the family business or not, or you incorporate this and ultimately you have some good business owners in the future. Are we so seeing a trend of next generation not staying in the family's business before, but now if that purpose is integrated, will uh, want to be part of it? Uh, that's or a complicated question, okay. I have to say, because uh, we probably see a trend that next generation don't want to manage their family businesses. And, and that's because next generations are stronger now and they are not forced to do it and, yeah. and they have more freedom and they live around the world, you know, People don't live in the same villages. There's anymore. an opportunity here, right? Yeah, yeah. There is a channel through which where I think 
many next generations become engaged in the family business simply from a more societal aspect. And, and that's a very positive channel. Yeah, thanks. So, Nick, what's your take on that? And what are you seeing uh, in terms of trends from uh, the so specific relationship you have with yeah. this? Uh, so next gen, is, as we refer to it, um, super important. I mean, it is, it is the future. And I think it, it is uh, a trend on, on two reasons, right? So along the lines of what you were saying, uh, Martin, so first you have the older matriarch, patriarch, who are finally looking for their legacy, and they and they care more <laughs> about their grandchildren having a planet okay. and whatnot. Okay. So, so they want to they want to uh, they want to have that legacy, and they want to care about the next generation. Um, and then you have the next generation who actually do care, right? And it's it's more embedded. They are empowered. It's a completely different generation than maybe mine. I have to remind my children constantly that my generation invented Earth Day. Um, otherwise, we're boomers, and we have ruined the planet for well, them. Well, we, right? we we haven't done great, so, right? So no, no, we have Neither say. has the generation before us, but we uh, haven't done very anyway. good. So. Um, so, but 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 that's important, and I think this generation really does care. And again, I've got more stats for you, so just for yes. fun. So, um, PwC released a study on next gen. So they talked to one thousand next gens across sixty countries. Sixty five percent picked growth of the business as their top priority, which is okay. You'd kind of think it might be more, but sixty five percent is pretty good. Six. 54% say they want to lead in sustainability and make that a ma major business practice. 55% say sustainability should be at the heart of their business. And 70%, the stat I gave earlier, um, feel they have a responsibility to lead reclimate um, and the planet themselves. So, so this is a to very business. Um, these are family business owners, absolutely, in the next gen. And we do see it on the investment side as well. Yeah. Um, the, How do you see the, it? How does that materialize? So, so again, we work at UBIS with a lot of uh, very wealthy individuals, and you, as you can imagine. Um, and, the, and we have legacy as one of the things that we talk about with them. It's an incredibly increasing trend toward things like climate and the planet. And uh, things they think, as, as they quote it, things they think their grandchildren need mm -hmm. or care about. So it, it, is a, it is a definite shift. Do they tend there. to bring them in the meeting with UBS? We do a lot of generational meetings, and a lot of our conversations are about how to build a family, and it doesn't have to be a family business, yeah. but a family um, financial status, the estate, if you will, estate planning in a different way than just setting up a trust, but how are you going to engage? Um, we just did one of these exercises with my family. I'll share it with you. Literally, uh, pictures, cards, and, and so you get a picture, and it's a picture of a dog, and what does that mean to you? And you have your answer, and then you, you look at my son, and you ask him. He's got a completely different picture, and you're talking about your family, about where they want to retire, and what they want to leave as a legacy, and where they want to be, and do they want to be in corporation, or whatever it is. It's fascinating to watch just how families come together across, around wealth. Um, so it's a trend we're seeing in every part of our business. Okay. Is that fair to say, Morton, that there is a, an increased ask in our business schools for this kind of workshops, executive education systems, oh, yes. where you bring the, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes, of course, there's, um, I mean. Sorry, I don't mean to do PR for INSEAD here, no, no, of course. No, no, no. Yes, but yeah. everywhere, no, but I mean, there's a yeah. huge demand Sorry. for, for Self building this into the business at every level of the business, both family business and non-family business, but it, it's, of course, driven by the young generation. So you do these workshops when you bring the different generations together yeah. to facilitate these conversations? Right. We often do that, yeah. Right. André, what's your perspective on next generation? And maybe your next generation is in the room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe I can start by uh, quoting Marx. Oh. Uh, uh, Groucho Marx, not, not Karl Marx. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, this is taking a whole different turn. <laughs> no. Okay. And, and I was getting very excited. Yeah, we, we can come back to that later. And, and Groucho, Groucho had this one. Finally, wonder... a great panel. Sorry. You're trying hard, aren't you? <laughs> so Groucho said once, um, you know, what should I do for the next generation? What have they ever done for me? <laughs> so I just wanted to introduce that, just you know, sort of start the project. Um, the, the 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 transfer from one generation to the other has to do a lot to do with societal things and also family things. And we, we we as a family, we are of course trying to aim for immortality because we go from generation to generation. If I look at the purely financial aspect, if I'm successful, the company, uh, the share increases, I should capitalize by selling the shares and diversifying, preferably in a portfolio managed by UBS. And, 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 so, and somehow, I think that's wrong, because that's, again, it's going back to this, uh, not UBS, of course, but, <laughs> it, it, you know, I'm going back it's to this taped. notion of responsibility. This event is recorded, right? <laughs> the, the reason why this is all for working well, the reason is, is because you have done your job as an owner properly. So if you now suddenly decide, uh, I, I deserve a reward, I'm selling, 
thing. Um, it, this is short term. This is not the way. Yes, it agreed. Be. And that immediately implies this responsibility of the next generation. The next generation realizes that there is only one way to continue: it's to think long term. And if you want to think long term, then you need to be a business as a force for good. Because if you, you don't go. address the societal issues, if you don't address the planetary limits, if you don't address the the the, um, the extractive nature of every big business, you are going to have to deal with it at some stage in the future. So you start managing your risk, and you start managing your risk by 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 dealing in a in a in a sustainable manner. C can I tell another story? Yes, you may. <laughs> so it's a story um, that, that I, 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 I it's the story of Planet Earth. Planet Earth is tired. It goes on a holiday, and it goes across the cosmos. Uh, when it goes, after a couple of months, it crosses another planet. The other planet says, "Hi, Planet Earth. How are you?" And Planet Earth replies, "Well, I have a bad case of Homo sapiens." <laughs> and the other planet replies the same thing as we have all individually replied to our friends who had COVID. We have all told the same thing: "Don't worry, it won't last." And that particular thing is what really, I mean, I get goosebumps when I tell that story, because mm. this is exactly what we should not let to happen. We are the solution, we are not the problem. And because we are the solution, we need to make sure that we do business as a force for good and that we as owner continue to do that in the long term. So this is perhaps a roundabout way of no, answering the important. question. Yeah. But, but um, uh, the, uh, going from the, our generation to the next generation is repairing the mistakes we have made. Right. And that's something we cannot hide from. So I'm, I'm sorry for the, the fifth generation of the Hoffman family. I'm sorry for the, the other generation of a lot of businesses. But it, there is a lot of work to be done. And our family businesses give us the tool to do that. Okay, and I think we understand that. So I have other questions, but let me open it to you. Yeah, because otherwise it's not fair. I'm having fun and you don't. Okay. Yes. Thank you. She was, she was first, I saw. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You second. It's not just because I'm a woman. No, 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 no. Thank you were first. You. Bring it closer to you. They keep on telling me the same thing. So, yeah. yeah. Can I, I build up in your story? You still listen? Can you build up in your story? I do like your example and your story, Andre. And for the, do you, how do you see the solution on it? Being on the one side, you need to keep on growing as an organization. You have shareholders. You need to keep being profitable, not only just being profitable, but keep growing and profitable. And at the same time, we're talking about how to be the solution and not the problem of yeah. it, right? How do you see that dilemma in the do future? Do you need to keep on growing? You take the mic. Do you want to keep on growing? Yes. Yeah, that's first, right? I can use somebody else's microphone. Yeah, you know. That's not COVID friendly. OK, sorry. Well, well, wash your hands. You know, this is, the, this is the, 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 the contradiction, the trade-off that has destroyed everything around yeah. us. We're always saying, well, the only thing that matters is that we grow and that we make a profit. So short-term profit maximization. Milton Friedman, the business of business is business. When we come out with money from the business, we give it to society, which will repair the damage. Well, I'm sorry, it hasn't worked. So we need to change that. And how do we change that? By making sure that every decision we take in our business includes not only the immediate benefit, but also an insurance premium for the risk, for the risk that's coming ahead of us. Um, the pandemic is so, I mean, this morning in this room, we had a, uh, an overview of the impact of humanity on the planet and how it has provoked the zoonosis, the, the, the new pathogen which have, which have created the, the pandemic as an example. Uh, the, the, the pandemic risk was absolutely obvious. It was number six or seven of different pathogens which was coming uh, towards humanity. And it has not been taken into account by the majority of society because we have continued to live like if there was literally no tomorrow. Well, if you want to continue to have a tomorrow, we need to start preparing now for the risks of tomorrow. And in order to do that, we need to put a little bit of money aside. Uh, I suppose most of you have heard that story before, but, but you know, it's the, like a car. You would never buy a car and drive it without an insurance because you know the accident is about to happen. So uh, we need to put a little bit of money aside in each transaction to manage the risk of the future. And th that doesn't mean only growing, because uh, if we grow, 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 the risk that we know is that we're going to reach planetary boundaries, and that would mean a downfall. So if you want to avoid the risk of the future, we also need to manage our growth in a way which, makes, which is re replicable. So we're going into the circular economy argument, and we can talk about this for a long hours, but this is not the purpose of today's, uh, of today's but things. Can I, yeah, can I add to that? I mean, in a more practical thing, I'm in the institutional markets, and every day, companies that are doing good or are making their climate statements or, or net zero, assuming they're legitimate, 
they are doing better. Their stock price is going up. Their, their credit spreads are going down in the market. They have more access to capital. Their capital costs are going down. All of the fundamental business things that will drive a more profitable business are coming as a result of that. And that is, that is the thing that the 17 SDGs and all of the talk and everything that's going on in Davos is actually having an effect right now on the profitability of these businesses. If most people aren't aware of this. I'll just challenge some business tenants. During the um, COVID pandemic, uh, one of the large financial institutions was told by their regulators they may not pay a dividend, may not pay a dividend to their shareholders if they were laying off employees. That is unheard of. Not in, in all of the years of business, that doesn't happen because the shareholders are the owners of the company. Regulators don't have the right to do that. Well, they do now, right? Putting your employees first, well-being of employees, all of the work that you're seeing is a completely different approach to business now. And that's because of all of this. So I think it's going to really give the infrastructure that we need to have businesses that do well for the planet and society will do better from a profitability standpoint as well. Yes, I think let's push on this uh, and uh, let me let me push on this a little bit by being a little bit provocative as well so that you can you can respond. But let me push a little bit. So on on the all those doing good are more profitable. I mean, there is actually uh, I mean, I'm, I think and from the, an academic perspective, you can mention it maybe, there's still a large debate about that. That depends on how you look at the kind of metrics that are put forward and also how deep the change is in the company. And we have now a, an, an important debate, in particular on the metrics, showing that you still have these higher profits because it's like soft touch, adjustment of the margin of the company. I just want to hear your reactions on that. I'm being provocative just so that we... No, uh, you know, look, we're, it's early days. Right, but when banks aren't lending to companies that aren't doing X, Y, Z, that a is eventually going to change their yeah. capital costs. That's absolutely going to change what people value their stock price out. It's again, this is assuming public companies, obviously, um, even private investments. I mean, we don't invest in something, certain products. I have to be careful what I say in this day and age. Um, <laughs> if they don't have diversity on their boards, if they don't, if there's so many criteria that are out there. It is going to drive change. It's not necessarily the P&L tomorrow, yeah. but these are fundamental shifts in how people do things. It's when banks have to measure uh, stress tests on climate risks and change their pricing model accordingly, this is going to change business. Yeah. Yeah. It yes. has to. It's not showing up maybe today, but uh, and I, ha any, I had any, to uh, poke. Uh, and if I can bring it back to the theme of today, uh, family owners can have the courage to do that. You don't have to listen to financial orthodoxy. You don't have to continue to say, I have to have the growth paradigm. Okay, Be on. courageous enough to say, no, come on. We, we, we're interested in the long term. Yes, and then I have the yeah, questions are coming in. Go, Martin. OK, I'll be no, very no, short. Uh, now to do that you turn financial, so I'm also the finance professor, I would say. I mean, the, the big, obviously, not all firms that do good are profitable, right? I mean, that, then we would have no problems, right? So so the trade-off is there, but, but part of the, the Wrong in the argument is that the way we financially measure risk is very backward looking, right? It's very backward. All our data is That's backward true. looking. And risk is changing. And I think this is also what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we never incorporated the uh, Russian going into Ukraine in the risk management of, of firms engaged in Russia, right? We never incorporated, uh, we try to, but we don't have metrics for some of the biggest catastrophe that might come, right? Which means, you know, it's not clear just because you were profitable <laughs> in the past for, for growing. We never incorporate uh, regulative changes in, in risk, right? So I think there's a, you know, you cannot conclude just because even destroying the company and uh, destroying the earth and, and making profit was good financially. It doesn't need to be it in the future. Okay, now, yeah, we're getting started, yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, so um, I'm a... <laughs> Yes, I'm a second uh, generation family yes. business representative, so I can feel much of the both possibilities and pains uh, associated with that. My question is with regards to business as a force of good, to take that on a second and a third level. Um, uh, first of all, question of ownership as a force for good. Uh, for families, we don't have only one business, but Often, what was mentioned, family offices. There's a lot of potential there to really also govern in a good fashion. And the last level, life as a force of good. We all have limited days on this planet. And how do we use our days to do something good? And it's, easy, I would say, a little bit easier for us to expect the business as a force of good 
because then we're also expecting uh, the whole organization to work for us. But we also have to lead as an example. So uh, my question is with regards to the family offices, which are also very significant players. Where do we put our resources? How do we do that in a sustainable uh, manner? What are your practices for um, good family business, uh, family uh, office uh, operations? Yeah, no, so Thank we you. work with a lot of family offices. Um, and the, the first thing we'll recommend is the same thing we do for a family business when you're setting your court. What's your objective? So when we design a portfolio for a family office or for any for an endowment or anybody out there, um, what's your objective? Again, 17 SDGs, they mean different things to everybody. So there's a lot of different ways you can go. The first recommendation is to focus. Um, it's virtually impossible, I'll throw out there, to find one thing that does all 17 well. It just doesn't exist. So focus your efforts. What do you care most about? Core to your values or your family or maybe the business that you're in where you think you can have the most impact and you focus there. And then there are investments all over that are going to be keyed toward those specific areas that you want to focus on. So, you know, we have impact bonds that work on pollution. We have impact bonds that work on DEI. We have impact bonds that work on um, uh, poverty or health issues in Africa, right? So you can, you can tailor your investments and therefore the return. I will add one other thing that's that's big now in the in the vernacular in the investing world is we no longer refer to returns. And if your FAs do come find UBS, um, because their financial returns are not necessarily the only type of return you'll have. So there's financial returns, there's social returns, and then there's impact. And as the world builds metrics and standardized metrics across impact and some of that social effect, then you're going to be able to measure returns in different ways and help gauge whether or not your objectives for your portfolio and your family office are being achieved. So a lot of data needed still, but yeah, the we're getting there. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, additional points on the uh, family office? Well, pe perhaps just uh, the, the fact that we've redistributed over the years our, our, our investments. I mean, obviously, 99% of our assets are in the family company. Uh, whatever is left after the dividend payment gets involved according to a certain formula. And that formula has evolved over the years. We have a very simple rule. We don't invest for money alone. We invest for um, something that can be measured uh, on, on a social front, on a, on a, on a human front, or, 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 on the, or on the natural front. And um, you know, there are many, many ways of looking at this. As you said very rightly, there are, there's metrics galore. I think the official test is the official uh, expression is the alphabet soup of different standards. I mean, there's everything you can think of. Uh, so you really need to develop your own one, which is, of course, a way of adding complexity. But um, uh, the important thing is that the short-term profit maximization is out. All the rest can, can, can help. Yeah, and we can add also what's material to your companies, not just what's aligned with the value, what's material to that. And then as part of the alphabet soup, maybe also the fact that, yes, it's a mess, things are being built, but you can look also at what the industries that you're working with and in are doing, and at least starting now, investing, and then adjusting as you know standards evolve and, and then the agenda moves forward. You next. Thank you. I very much appreciate this notion of this long-term thinking, patient thinking. And if I take it as a metaphor and then project it onto the business of the UBS, and you mentioned that the figure of 85% and the relation of uh, engineering and construction, right? And if I may add one more figure, and most research says that 90% of the building stock uh, in 2050 is going to be existing building stocks. So only 10% is going to be the building stock constructed from 2020 to 2050. So we have to deal with existing patients. And, and in this um, context, how do you see this two Cs you uh, added to the conversation, culture and communication, that help us to formulate and achieve the goals as we are formulating as a society? It, it, you say that one of the biggest um, opportunities we see in investing in real estate is retrofitting buildings, right? Um, you have to do something with what you have, not just because there's no space, but taking down a building takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, versus just retrofitting the building that you have. So it's... You know, again, this is where new tech comes in. You've all read about smart cities and lights that come on because the sidewalks smart from you know tiny feet before you get there and whatnot to conserve energy. Buildings will be the same way. It's not just materials, um, but there is a new kind of concrete. So when you replace, when they need to be refit, when you set have to do a new foundation, you can do it in a better way. It's, it's along the lines of putting in solar panels in every house that gets built these days. It's part of what's happening. So eventually. That, that turn happens, and you just have to keep rewarding it. Sadly, I think the world needs incentives to do that, 
um, yeah. because it's going to get, by the way, cheaper and cheaper to build the old way because those will be the materials nobody's using. There'll be excess. The prices will go down. So there's going to be a challenge here on doing the new better thing coming. Yeah, there was a session actually in the tent that addressed part of, you know, rethinking the built environment. It was in connection also to the capital coalition session in terms of what, you know, we're doing in terms of cement and rethinking that. Uh, so maybe you, want, you can see them online. So I'd suggest uh, maybe whether. So, ah, yes, that was you. And you were the first in the room, so you deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, so I have a question when it comes to the commitment piece that you were mentioning very early on. And I would like to start by quoting an article that Andre um, shared on Twitter seven months ago, so he might not remember. Uh, uh, but the article was about um, a dichotomy be between uh, the bad companies and the good NGOs. And the quote goes, uh, the, the traditional form of philanthropy has failed. You might feel good about yourself, but it doesn't solve problems. And so my question about the commitment piece is, and if you can give me examples of sentences, I would appreciate it. In the conversation with other people, um, how, do you, how do you call them out in the conversation when the commitment is um, a very nice initiative, uh, whether it's green or gender, et cetera, but it doesn't fundamentally change the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and if I may give an example from my personal life, um, I have many friends that are female founders of their technology startups. And um, the conversations that we usually have is, um, please do not invite us to another panel on how it's like to be a woman leading a company. Just you know, deploy your capital in a way that reflects how you care about women leading companies so that we don't have to spend our time on another panel. So um, how do you, oh, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, so um, how, do you, how do you have these conversations with people? Because you know, I'm sure that everybody wants to do good, uh, but in a certain point, it's like, it's nice, but it's not doing anything. All right, well, I'll start because she's looking at me, Thanks. but then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so the, what we're talking about, the, the first thing you do, if you, you focus, you figure out what your priority is going to be, and then we've all talked about metrics. Right? What is your impact going to be? Because as soon as you try to measure something, it stops being foofy, just corporate speak, and you know, kind of that, that loosey goosey kind of yeah, we're doing good somehow. Um, because when you start thinking about your industry or your specific company, your value proposition, your front to back operations, who your so sources are in your supply chain, you're going to identify a lot of places that maybe you're not making the impact you could, consistent with your values. And then you can very specifically find things, actions, things, steps that you can take that will drive. And then I will say I think that's self-fulfilling because as soon as you see the impact that you have on, say, changing your suppliers because you're trying to make an impact and then the supplier you walked away from comes back and they've changed their business model because they want your business again, it, it, it is encouraging and it's gratifying. So. How do you call out on the force for good washers? Uh, I think was the question. Yeah. No? Well, yeah, you were very, you were nice to saying that. I you don't have to. And again, we're we're bankers, right? So you want yeah. to do good, and you're not doing good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're the client. No, and that's the question um, for no. all of you. Okay. Yeah, that's why you set a metric, uh, right? I, exactly. I think it's easier for me to answer because we yes. are we are the school teachers, right? I mean, we we uh, we have the play privilege of have a private room where we teach or engage with the families, right? And and. And what we always start with is cases, right? And and you know you you get if 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 I have to answer very specific, right? Then yes, we would give a case of a family which may not internalize the business, but doing extremely good on the philanthropic side, right? And then everybody can discuss that case because that's a neutral space, right? And and when you have discussed these cases, you easily go out to you know ask questions about what are you doing yourself, and and that's often very very powerful. Um, and I would say also, uh, sometimes they are called out by their kids very, very um, aggressively, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, you know, this discussion between children and parents can be uh, very direct in, in this sense, right? So the role of education, the role of conversation, I get that. What about the role of regulation to clarify this and also prevent more of this uh, greenwashing or impact washing? I think that, too, okay, now it becomes a little bit deeper, right? I mean, there, there are two things which are very challenging. One is 
regulation because it requires a lot of knowledge and obviously not all firms are the same. That doesn't mean that we should try to do the best regulation. Uh, economists are really good. I'm an economist at coming up with regulative impact, right? But, but it's hard to fit. I mean, they will not solve everything. It has to come from the business itself. And the other thing is obviously the metrics, right? And, and it is a dilemma. I mean, the good thing is that there's a huge investment. I mean, just these events here yeah. and all the accounting firms. I mean, there's a huge investment in developing uh, accountability, which is non-financial or include non-financial stuff. But it is super difficult. And the other thing when we talk about family business is that that there is this dilemma that um, you quoted some research. But the way I read research is that if we just take the boxes, you know, the metric boxes, at least uh, on average, family firms don't do as well as non-family firms. And and the dilemma, of course, is, you know, is that because family firms are not doing all this, or is it because they don't care about the metrics, right? And and obviously, if you're a non-family firm <laughs> and you hire people like me or us economists, you are very good at you know doing exactly so. You check all the boxes, right? But but is that really at profound changes? So I think the the metric thing is a huge challenge. Yeah. But we are doing a lot of you know, it's it's moving. I mean, just yeah. from the last two, three years. Let me, let me just, it's really hard to do, right? Um, so let's just look at the press, right? You have a fossil fuel company who is rated on the top of the ESG rankings, right? There's lots of rating agencies now because they are great from a DEI perspective. And you have a low carbon electric vehicle maker who is thrown off the index because he doesn't do labor rights well. 17 SDGs. So which is why I said from the beginning, if you, you have to focus, you have to pick the ones you're going to do because nobody does it all well. And this is one of the risks, by the way, on anybody that's going to say no, which again, I, I, I only say that facetiously as a client, but the reality is if they're going to do well on that one and they're not doing well on this one, that's their call. Right? So if they if they object, if they want to do this one and they don't do that, then metrics can help. But be really careful. It's hard to point at someone and say they're not doing a good job because it will depend on what their objectives were and what metrics you use yeah. and how the ratings are set. It, it's really, really tough out there, you guys. Yeah. So same again. I think there were conversations in this tent earlier on how to actually uh, value different forms of capitals and how to consider them in your bus business. And you can also check from you know the investors you're talking to and about how they do that themselves. Look in the books. Did you want to add anything on that, André? Yeah, I, I want to completely contradict you, if I may. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, I, I take the view that if somebody is good on one of the 17 SDGs, Thanks. the likelihood of them being good on the other is much higher than if it's somebody who isn't good on one of the SDGs. So um, yes, you need to focus, I agree. You need to concentrate on what you do well. But if you take one of these SDGs as one of the reference points, then the others will matter as well to you. And so uh, well-run businesses will score better on this. What I'm trying to say here is to um, warn against the idea of too much specialization. You know, uh, the, the, the focus on short-term profit maximization has destroyed the planet because we only looked at these financial flows and we didn't look at the consequences of how we got to these financial flows. Now, suddenly, the only metric that matters is CO2. We only concentrate on CO2. But if you are going to plant eucalyptus in, us, in Latin America, you're going to destroy ecosystems, which will create much bigger lasting damages than just the CO2 capture. And so it's important that to put that into perspective. You need to make sure that um, uh, you do not create collateral damages by getting to the wrong metrics. So I, I would say that the, the, the principle, operating principle of the SDGs was exactly that. How do we manage the impact of businesses? How do we create a sustainable system? And if you are sustainable in one dimension, you are much more likely to be sustainable than others. Okay, I'm not going to disagree. Yeah, no, yeah. Because Go ahead. So, but but for example, we have pledged to progress across all 17 SDGs. Yeah. But we're focusing on health and education. Yeah. But just to, to find some focus. But I'm going to I'm going to digress and tell you a story. So so we're addressing Next one story. of the issues around uh, female capital, as you mentioned, right? Uh, women VC never get any money. They don't get it at you know a quarter of the rate of the men VC uh, founders, et cetera, et cetera. So we start a fund. And we call it the Carmen Fund. And the Carmen Fund is made up of uh, strategies. I think I'm not allowed to say fund. Um, and the strategy is all female hedge fund managers or fund managers. And the idea is to get these women the profile and the investment that they typically wouldn't get. And when we go out and sell it, one of the things we get, the feedback we get back is, OK, your women managers, great. But you're only investing in women-owned businesses, right? And they're like, well, 
No, that wasn't the deal. But but this is the problem with maybe to your point too much specificity. But this is you have to take it all in context, and that's again I'm just saying it's really hard to do. Yeah. Can you imagine a fund where only family controlled businesses? If uh, Pavan, I don't know if Pavan is in the room, if he was there, are you here? Because uh, can you react to that and say what you're saying in the classroom about the integrating? Okay, thanks. Yes, please, if, please react. If, say say right. what you're telling, telling our students in terms of the integration yeah, of that so framework. If I were to try and achieve human health, that is uh, SDG 3, how could I do it without focusing on human diets and the sustainability of food, which is SDG 2? And how could I do it without climate? Because, as you know, there's a huge correlation. In fact, uh, the last uh, Tyler Prize for the environment was won by somebody for the connections between climate and human health. So therefore, I need to focus on SDG 13. And how could I do it without looking at the quality of water, which is therefore SDG 6, or for that matter, poverty, which enables me to have access and availability of good health care. So how could I actually achieve human health by simply focusing on SDG 3? That's my question. And it's, it is a great question, but let me tell it a different way. When we went paperless in our office, and I sent out the email to all our employees saying, no more cups, everybody bring your own mug, we're going to save trees, we're going to do good for the planet, I got 100 emails immediately saying, thank you, this is awesome, we're so excited you guys are making a statement. Within a half an hour, I had 100 others saying, don't you care about water? We need yeah. to preserve water. You've just wasted so much water because everybody has to wash their mug themselves. We have to do all of them, and I don't disagree with that. Please don't think I disagree with that. What I'm saying is it becomes so difficult for anybody to even conceive of being able to do all 17 at once that maybe we sit in inertia and nobody does anything. And I think picking your focus or understanding whatever your family business is, your specific value chain, your specific front to back, and you can identify areas where you can affect change would be, I would suggest, a better use of your time and energies, and you don't get fr as frustrated as you might if you tried to solve everything. Yes, and I think, you know, we agree with that, and the idea is not to put someone on, on, on the spot, but maybe to provide yeah. an answer an example, and a solution yeah. to that. I think an exam one example of how to address exactly the problem, Suni, that, that you've raised is if we were to go down the route of measuring impacts, and these methodologies and systems are available even from my company, a tiny company in Switzerland, <laughs> but um, the thing is that if we do that, That's then we right. can actually allocate and attribute those capital's impacts on natural capital, That's human and social yeah. across the 17, at least 15 of the 17 yeah. SDGs. Now, if you know that, then you could, based on the strategies that you follow and, the imp and looking at your operations and looking at your, your business, you could make changes which would overall have a reduction in your negative impacts on the SDG, potentially even positive impacts on the positives, such as education, and, and healthcare and so on, which you're involved with at a company. So, I mean, of course, you can't say that, well, I want to do exactly 8% increase in every SDG because life doesn't work like that. But sure, you could look at a strategy which overall increases your impacts across the entire SDG spectrum. I have examples of that. So yeah, Apple thanks. Said, and and that, maybe the answer is yeah. first do no harm. Maybe that's it, yeah. right? You well, progress and where you I said me don't measure impact. pick First, a step know back. whether you are or Thank are not doing question. harm. I mean, that's yeah. the stuff. And that conversation will continue in the coffee break because that's not the theme, but that's important. So I think to say, and anyway, the, the, I think the main point is that, yes, it is complicated and super complex. And I think the war also has shown how everything is interconnected. It is super complex, but we have to, we have to still uh, keep at it. But let's continue that. Thanks. Uh, you next. Thank you. I think all of us, and that's probably where your family is coming from, that need to do this. The, the space between good for business and business for good is always about money and giving money away well or investing money well. And those who try to do that uh, learn really fast how technical and how hard that actually is. Um, family foundations are... a, a, a a very common vehicle for this work for family businesses. And uh, we hope they are 2.0 at this point. And the question is for those like me who manage and run and help to inform strategies for family businesses with their family foundations, any tips, particularly f because next gen for my clients is not one generation. We have the 80 year olds who are still alive and, and quite active in the business. Then you have the 50 year olds, you have the 20 year old, you have the 13 year olds. So that next gen is actually multi-generational. So what is a tip? What is something I can do as an advisor to help him and his family? Let me just, if I may, broaden that question in 
terms of, it's a little bit provocative also, in terms of the, what's the role of philanthropy in this business as a force for good? Andrea, I have to start with you. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah, I well, uh, um, uh, the, the, um, maybe I can quote the tweet uh, uh, that, that, that was quoted before. You know, um, uh, the, the idea of saying I have to make business, um, I, I have to invest for money, I have to invest for return, I have to make sure that I make money, and I, therefore I can sort of, you know, go to the point and make, make, make that margin. And if I make a bit of profit, I can then give it back to a certain way, because I've taken, so I need to give back. And that principle of philanthropy really, really does not inspire me much. I would prefer by far to start with a a, a, an investment that actually takes into account the 17 SDGs, the free capitals, the human, the, the social, and the natural, before having to give back. This notion that it is okay to rape humanity because you are doing philanthropy is unacceptable. And yet it's a norm, and that's what we all do. We, we all have on the one hand uh, some money that we give away and some money that we, that we invest. And we really need to break that particular boundary. We need to be able to sort of make a difference between the two. So my advice for you, next generation, and I remember the next generation, I used to be one not so long ago. <laughs> my, my advice for the next generation is, you know, try to not look at this in little silos. Try to ha have a little bit more imagination. What you're trying to do is not to, just to maintain the, a disproportionate amount of your wealth in in invested in liquidity, what you're trying is to do something positive. What is success? Success is not having more money in the bank. Success is being happy. So go and be happy. You know, do something that makes you feel good. But does it mean that then the success is not about growing your family foundation? It, no, going for the sake of growth is certainly not a solution. What's important is the impact you're having. What's important is what the result you obtain. And if, if it means that you drive a Ferrari rather than a De Chevaux, well, then be it. You know, the, the, or the opposite, of course. You know. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I, it might sound a little bit wishy-washy and blue-eyed what I'm saying, but I really do think that at the end of the day, you should be able to look at yourself in the mirror and to decide if what you're doing is the right thing or not. And if the only thing that matters for you is to make sure that you have made money out of your investment uh, without taking into account the impact you've had, you know, there's probably something wrong somewhere. Do you think that family foundation should work more closely with the actual business part to try and push that agenda further there? So that's, of course, the ideal solution. I think philanthropy should die out because we don't need it to repair, to repair the, the, the mistakes made. Uh, the, the idea that you spend money after the event in order to repair the mistakes made in the creation of the value, I think that it, the moment we can stop that, the better. By the way, the same thing for NGOs. You know, we don't yeah. need NGOs if we have, a, if we have an, a society that works well. Society doesn't work well, so of course we do need the NGO at the moment. But that's the ultimate aim. Uh, if I was the, the CEO of WWF, who I hope is not in the room, uh, I, I would... You I, have I, the I chairman. Would, <laughs> I, would try, I would try to do everything I can to make my role obsolete, because, you know, that, that's why I exist, to repair. So I guess the answer is how to... Sorry. <laughs> but I think this idea of system change, this, yeah, this idea of system change and what's your best way of triggering that through the foundation, through the family office, through the business is what to look at in terms of impact. Morton, you wanted to react to that. Yeah, no, actually, I totally agree with everything you said, but let me raise another thing which I actually think is a positive thing that, you know, if, if you are investing, I mean, the tools we use for investing is at least 50 years old. They were made in the 50s by Markowitz, all these diversification models, right? For 40, 50 years, nothing happened. Right now, a lot of researchers, a lot of smart people are building investment models that take into account the ECG. Um, so it's a dual kind of thing, right? One is we need the metrics. We need to be able to measure somehow the, the ECG factors. But the moment we have that, you know, there are papers now on the very high level of research that can make financial models that include all of these things in, in the traditional finance thing. And I'm, you know, I'm confident in two, three years, these, these are in practice. So, so, so I think it's a dual size. One is that we need these tools in, in the investment when we talk family office. And the other thing is, of course, we need to find the place of, of the values and, and, and the motivation of this, right? So you wanted to yeah, react. I was going to say, maybe I'll be a little more practical. Um, you're not alone, right? And you, and you need to remember that, right? So there are peer networks on how to give one of the most successful things we do, what we call collectives. All we're doing is putting like-minded clients together. So we have, for example, a collective around autism. And... 50 different clients reach out and say, we care, we want to do something. We put them in a room together, we help advise them on how to do philanthropy, how to be smart about how you're investing, how to drive 
more impact at scale, and then they do it. So there are lots of networks out there that connect you with people that have the same objectives and values that you do, and then you can create scale maybe by partnering with other peers that are thinking about the same thing. Yeah, and there is also a movement that is being discussed around here on strateg strategic philanthropy, I think it's called, to look at this broader impact that you can have through a, through a foundation that you may want to be, con and I'm, I can connect you, but I think that's interesting as well. You're going to have the last question before we wrap up. Uh, th thanks. Um, going back to Andre, and you mentioned the, uh, the employees already, and I wanted, to, uh, wanted you just to dive a little bit more on the role of employees also as multipliers of culture and values. Hmm. If you rally people around that purpose of doing now what patients need next, wouldn't you want them to share the very same perspective as you as an owner of having communities that are still around tomorrow, having a company to work for that's still around tomorrow, serving their communities and also keeping that in mind when they make any of the day-to-day -day decisions on how to price a new drug in market XYZ for Roche and others? I don't see this as a question. This is an affirmation and I completely support it. I mean, the, the purpose of the company is to do something. And if everybody does it together, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the generic company here, is to do something. And if everybody does it together, it is a self-replicating mechanism. Success comes like this, you know, by, by making sure that you follow the inspiration that comes to, to, to life. But, but then there's and, not that much even of a difference between the owners and the employees, right, in, in what you want them to represent. Oh, well, as I was trying to say before, I don't think that owners are, I mean, legally owners are not the ones who benefit most of the corporation. You know, we employ 100,000 people. These 100,000 people have an impact uh, of a huge proportion on the society in which they live. Uh, you know, it's about livelihood, it's about salaries, it's about uh, social structures. Obviously, their importance is much bigger than the importance of the shareholders. You know, they, 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 there's no comparison. Uh, our impact is much bigger there. Because one of the things I, I've been trying to sort of talk about since the beginning is this notion that how do we measure success? We measure success by impact that we're having. Impact on the social system, how we work together, and that's the one you've just addressed. Impact on human level, how do we foster happiness among the people we work with? How do we get self-realization, the, sum, the, the summit of the Maslow Pyramid? How do we make sure that people use their talent to find happiness in their own life? And then, of course, the natural, which is the system, the life support system on Earth. If you get a positive impact on these three capitals, the rest will follow. And the rest is a consequence. It's not, it's yeah, not a... Thanks. That's... Any additional points on the employee piece? Because we also see oh, that yes. companies <laughs> that are, you know, in that space uh, and engage their employees in the purpose, yeah, uh, better retention rates, etc. Yeah, so, yeah. I, feel, I feel I'm destroying the, the environment here now because um, Obviously, we have this, or many family firms have this perception that the employees are much better off in family firms and they like being there and the work environment is better in family firms. All research that we are doing, and I've just been doing research on 7,000 family firms, says on average, the working environment in family firms are on average not as good as in non-family firms. <laughs> so okay. we all know the good family firms. We all know they are where people love to work, but you know, the, 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 Profit maximizing <laughs> entrepreneur who, who is very concerned about growing and, and this are not always treating the employees very good in the family firm. So I think there's a huge space for many family firms to improve this, to generate these externalities of the employees being this, but it's not there yet. And, and you should all from the family businesses actually take this serious because we have no, in our data and our research, we cannot see in general that family firms have better work environment. So, did you want to add something? I was just say that's yeah. the that's the PL. Loyalty, lower retention, uh, or better retention, lower attrition rates helps your bottom line. So it's self-fulfilling. Yeah. Thank you. With this, sorry, you have more time in this room as well for uh, continue to continue the conversation as we wrap up. So we have some of uh, the family offices in the room. If you were to leave them with like one key thing, they, you know, a couple key things you would like them to do going back to the job maybe on Monday, um, what would that be? Morton? I know, I know academics are not good at giving like clear recommendation and advice. It's like, <laughs> it depends, but for on this one. Are you giving me 15 say? minutes? Or? No, no. <laughs> no, no, I would say, and I'm a little bit afraid uh, no, no, now I'm starting afraid. here, but I would You're simply fine. say that, you know, it's not enough how you spend your money. You really have to be responsible on how you generate this money. That's your yeah, line. Yeah, I was a kid. Yeah, that's you, you stole his line, and which is why you're like, Indra Nuyil line. Yeah. I think. 
Uh, find a peer network. They're out there, and I think you can learn a lot, share best practices, build scale um, for your impact. Thank you, Cindy. And, and I, I would perhaps just say that one of the reasons why you are the family control business is successful is because the owners, the initiators, the guys who started at the beginning were courageous. They went against the trend and they started a business according to their own beliefs, which led to success. So I would encourage owners to continue to be courageous and to not listen to all the things they tell you at business school. You know, just go and do the right thing. You know, just you know what is the what success looks like. You know what the life should be should should be about. You know how to look after the employees. You know how to serve the purpose of the company. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Be bold. And I'm sure it will all work out better. Don't listen to what they say in business school, to what they say in panel in the SDG tent. With this, André, Suni, and Morton, thank you very much. Let's the, con the conversation continue. Thank you for coming.